Hello everyone, my name is Ian Wen and I'm the General Manager at Promochrome Technologies. We appreciate working with partners in the industry to bring forth the most effective solutions for testing labs. It is a pleasure to be joining Waters and our mutual customer Katahdin today to present our flexible extractor that can run multiple methods on a single unit. I will also be sharing details and results of our anti-clogging solutions and features for tackling dirty samples. As we learn more about the occurrence and associated health risks of PFAS, regulations and lab testing are working towards lower monitoring limits. In June 2022, EPA revised the health advisory limits of PFOA and PFOS from the original combined 70 PPT to just 0.004 PPT and 0.02 PPT respectively. These numbers are meant to suggest what is expected to be safe PFAS levels over a lifetime of exposure. From a regulatory standpoint, EPA later proposed National Maximum Contamination Limits, MCLs, of 4 PPT for PFOA and PFOS, and a combined 1 PPT for PFNA, PFHXS, PFBS, and GenX. States such as California, New York, and Michigan have also revised their limits to be around 10 PPT or lower while proposing further stringency. So how are the testing labs handling these ever-decreasing PFAS limits? Well, the good news is that majority of the PFAS testing labs have already achieved 2 PPT or lower reporting levels. To achieve this practically, they're using solid phase extraction, SPE, to first concentrate the samples. If we look at EPA method 1633, a 500 mL sample extracted with 5 mL of methanol would constitute a 100-fold concentration. So instead of finding the equivalent of one droplet in 10 Olympic-sized swimming pools, which is 2 PPT, we're narrowing it down to the pool I wish I had in my backyard. Such low limits now become attainable on most instrumentation. As you can see, I snuck in our SPO3 system in the middle to represent the solid phase extraction stage. This is our 8-channel automated extractor that has helped more than 120 PFAS labs in the States. Moving on, aside from concentrating the samples, the SP procedure also serves to remove matrix interference, which can affect measurement accuracy on the instrumentation. Introducing field samples directly to an LCMSMS can lead to clogging or contamination. By running all the samples through an SP cartridge, you're physically removing particulates down to the micron level and chemically removing interferences. This results in cleaner extracts going to the instrumentation, which minimizes costly maintenance. Given the benefits of SPE, it is utilized by many PFAS analytical methods spanning drinking water and other matrices. What would a lab running these methods need to look out for? Firstly, PFAS samples can come in various container types. Even though 250 mL samples are mandated by methods 537.1 and 533, they can come in different bottle shapes and mouth sizes. EPA method 1633 includes containers ranging from 60 mL all the way to 1 liter, and we've also encountered customers using tiny 30 mL bottles. So for a lab that's running more than one method, how would you load and rinse all these sample containers? Keep in mind that for PFAS applications, you also have to rinse all of these containers to recover the stickier compounds. Do you need a different system for each bottle size, or would you have to purchase dedicated samplers or racks? Um, and what happens when you change bottle vendors? These are all real-life considerations by our customers, and we have consolidated our experience to provide an all-in-one package. A generic PFAS configuration of the SPO3 would include both the Mod004 and Mod00P mounting options as shown here. Mod004 on the left deals with any bottles that are up to 250 mL in size, whereas Mod00P on the right addresses the full range of sample containers. Mod004 dates back to 2018 when we first addressed EPA methods 537. The upside-down mounting mechanism makes it easy to mount your samples and reduces carryover by not having external lines that submerge in the samples. It also maximizes sample transfer and allows simultaneous rinsing and shaking of the bottles to attain good coverage, even on rectangular bottles. Here's a video showing how the bottle rinsing works using Mod004. The adapter caps can also be swapped out for new ones when using bottles with different threads. Mod00P was later developed as more labs needed to run non-potable water. 
It sports a top-down rinsing mechanism with adjustable clamps that can accommodate any sample container that we've come across. This video provides a good visualization. Now that we've covered the loading and rinsing of different sample containers, what's next? The biggest difference between these methods is of course the type of sample matrices. EPA method 1633 would be the most comprehensive in terms of covering the full range of aqueous and solid matrices. This is where we run into samples that have significant particulate matter that can cause SP cartridge clogging or remain within the extraction system. EPA methods 537.1 and 533 would be performed directly using the MOS004 upside down mounting configuration. Here are the average results of lab controlled spikes, LCSs, for EPA methods 537.1 and 533 taken from the Orange County Water District and Alpha Analytical, respectively. The orange and blue bars represent extractions performed on the vacuum manifold versus SPO3. This provides a good representation that the SPO3 generates excellent results while freeing up lab personnel for more meaningful activities. Presentations dedicated to these drinking water methods can be found on Promochrome's YouTube channel, as I won't be covering them too much today. The non-drinking water methods is where more flexibilities are required. The SPO3 has been used for draft EPA method 1633, ISO 21675, as well as other in-house methods. I will be focusing on EPA method 1633 as it's the most relevant and consistent across PFAS labs. The data here is shared by our customer, Claros Technologies, who is ISO accredited for EPA method 1633. The following chart shows the recoveries of their 40 analytes across four LCSs during the initial demonstration of precision and recovery. The average recoveries were between 83% to 126%. Um, the percentage RSDs were below 10% for all compounds with the one exception of PFMPA, which had one single LCS recovering low. They have since switched to waters, wax cartridges, and LCMSMS that have demonstrated better consistency. As this method uses isotope dilution, the analyte recoveries do not tell the full story as any losses get compensated. I would therefore be leveraging the isotope recoveries, also referred to as labeled compound recoveries, in the later slides. Even though the draft EPA method 1633 mentions that samples should have less than 50 milligrams of solid content, many labs encounter higher amounts of solids. This can include sediments, floaters, or very fine suspensions, which intrinsically pose a major challenge towards SPE as they can easily clog the cartridges or lines. You simply cannot treat them the same way as drinking water samples. Practical implementations need to be in place. Based on the types of samples we've encountered, Promochrome has devised a suite of anti-clogging solutions. Unlike pre-filtering samples, these inline implementations do not require extra sample processing before extraction and ensures good recovery. In total, there are three lines of defense which the lab can choose from depending on their sample nature. The first is our anti-clogging tips that can be connected to the tip of our sample lines. They help to block out sediments and floaters that can easily clog internal lines. This is a new implementation that is proven to be quite effective. The picture on the right shows the use of our anti-clogging tip for seawater samples that contain algae and fine sand. According to the customer, the tips maintain smooth sample flow and do not affect their recoveries. Further downstream is our high capacity inline filter. This secondary anti clogging solution screens out particulates that can build up in a system or cause SP cartridge clogging. They can withstand more particulate matter than typical syringe filters and come with standard lure ends for easy connection. Many labs that run non potable water use these routinely to alleviate challenges with sample particulates. Lastly, our anti clogging frits can be placed directly on the SP cartridge frit. They serve to handle very fine particulates that still make it through the inline filters and clog the SP cartridges. Multiple anti-clogging frits can be stacked to increase their capacity. 
Next, we will discuss some results obtained using our inline filters to demonstrate that unlike conventional offline filtration, they do not affect compound recoveries. This is because they form part of the flow path, similar to packing glass wool in the SP cartridge. To illustrate this, Claro's Technologies has performed in a single batch of extraction, four LCSs that were directly extracted and four LCSs that were extracted using our inline filters. We will be looking at the labeled compound recoveries to assess the actual performance of the extraction. Looking at the directly extracted LCSs that did not use inline filters, most compounds fall within 80% to 120%. Depending on the choice of SP cartridges and instrumentation, labs may see varying results. If you notice that the methyl and ethyl sulfonamides are recovering at eight, around 60%, it is known that these neutral compounds tend to recover lower, especially in field samples. This is why the later EPA method 1633 drafts have widened their acceptance limits. Even though the sulfonamido ethanol recoveries are in the 80 to 90% range here, we have seen several labs that only achieve close to 50%. Our studies have shown that these neutral compounds tend to stay behind in the SP cartridge, which can be further recovered by using more elution solvents. For many reasons, that's not ideal, so we have introduced a boost function on the SP03, which can elute the SP cartridge bidirectionally with the same aliquot of solvent as many times as you like. Think of it as performing multiple elutions but without extra solvent. I hope that is a helpful overview of recovery expectations, uh, especially for labs who are new to this method. I'm now going to be sharing the recoveries from the same batch of samples that used our inline filters. So here's comparing the results from two of the samples that had inline filters throughout the extraction. As you can see, any differences are minimal and there's no general trend as to which set of samples had better overall recoveries. This is expected as during the bottle rinsing step, the solvents are drawn back through the filters to recover any trapped analytes. Similar to using Boost, we also redirected the rinsing solvent back and forth through the inline filter three times. Note that this does not require any additional solvent. We're reusing the same five mils of basic methanol for the final rinsing and elution. For the last two samples with inline declogging, we simulated a practical scenario where samples can occasionally still clog up the high capacity inline filters. The procedure is to replace with a new inline filter and reattach the clogged filter above the SP cartridge after the sample loading stage. The attachment is shown on the left and can be achieved with the latest SP cartridge adapters on the SP03. This allows any trap analytes to be recovered in line with the SP cartridge. Once again, you can see that even with this maneuver, the recoveries shown by the orange bars are similar. The LCS labeled compound recoveries fall well within the method limits, thereby providing a practical solution for challenging samples. While relocating the filter is a simple step, at Promochrome we like to strive towards full automation to maximize the convenience for our customers. As such, we have implemented a filter declogging feature on the SP03. During sample loading, the system can push the samples in the reverse direction at preset intervals to clear up blockages. This proved to be effective for some customers that previously encountered filter clogging. Here's a quick video showing how the filters are purged. I'll be SP, uh, okay, so this last part is very straightforward. Different PFAS methods call for their own sets of solvents. EPA method 537.1 uses reverse phase SP, so there's just pure methanol and water. The rest of the methods employ weak anion exchange and therefore have variations of basic methanol, acids, and buffers. The SPO3 system now comes with seven solvent lines, allowing all three methods to be run on the same system without having to exchange any of the solvent bottles. Even though EPA methods 533 and 1633 have different basic methanol concentrations, we understand that labs like to prepare these solvents fresh during the extraction. As such, they can share a single solvent line. Labs can now simply bring up the program method, attach the corresponding SP cartridges, and push start. In summary, the SP03 provides a single and convenient platform for all the PFAS SP methods out there. 
Our suite of anti-clogging solution allow labs to expand their automation to more challenging matrices. The flexible features on the SPO3 also helps to maximize recoveries and automation without deviating from the method procedure. At this time, I'm happy to answer any questions, and for future correspondence, here's my email and the web link to our PFAS applications page. Thank you.